Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hey y'all, it's Wednesday at 7 p.m. And so now it's time to welcome you to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors, endless stories. I'm Mary Kay Andrews and I'm hosting tonight and we are thrilled that you are all here. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm Kristen Harmel. <laughs> I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. <laughs> I'm Patty Callahan Henry. Hi, Mary Alice Monroe. Every week, y'all. Every <laughs> week, Every literally the same order. Week. That that time was on me. Sorry. <laughs> oh man, there's a lot of blonde going on here tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, back to business. As you all know, part of our mission for Friends in Fiction from the start has been to support independent booksellers. This week, we're supporting Tombolo Books in beautiful Saint Petersburg, Florida which happens to be my hometown and also the hometown of Kristen, who apparently can't remember her name. <laughs> um, you are um, going to want to buckle up your seatbelts tonight and leave the nightlight on because tonight we're going to be chatting with best-selling writer, Lisa Unger, author of 18 novels, including her most regent, recent confessions on the 745. This twisty, totly plotted psychological thriller kept me guessing and sleepless for much of last week. Um, and, and while you're staying up all night with your <laughs> nightlight on, you can be snacking on Mama G's because from the moment the first case of Mama G showed up at the Henry house, there has been a scramble for who gets what box. I take and hide <laughs> the gluten-free boxes, but the boys hide the cookies and cheese straws and pretend that they're gone. <laughs> so what they don't know is the good part. And that's the story behind the delicious food. Kathy Cunningham was a successful, unfulfilled radio exec in Atlanta when she realized that her mama G's own cheese straws were far superior to any others. Amazing snacks and a woman owned empire. That is something we can get behind. At, here at Friends in Fiction, try them. You'll be glad you did. And you can get 20% off on your online order with the code FAB5. And also a huge thank you to our partner, Page One Books, which offers hand-selected bookseller curated three, six, or 12 month subscription boxes. So you know that thrill that you get when you've ordered a package and you forget what it is and you get to open it like it's a surprise. It's kind of like that because they are picking books they know you're going to love. They come to your door and it's going to be a book that you love because a real human, amazing, avid book lover and reader is choosing the book for you. So if you're a first time subscriber, you can get 10% off with the code FAB5 at pageonebooks.com. And now we're going to bring our author in, Lisa Unger. Lisa, where are you? I'm here. <laughs> she is. Hi, Hi, Lisa. Hello. She was yeah. hiding. Hiding. <laughs> Welcome, yeah. Lisa. Thank you. It's so we great are... to be here with you guys. I appreciate it so much. We love having you. We're so happy you could be here because I, for one, am dying to know how a nice suburban mom <laughs> who lives in sunny St. Pete can write such diabolically dark <laughs> thrillers. And this thriller is a, would you call this a domestic thriller, Lisa? I I suppose I would call it a domestic thriller since, you know, it, it's very much sort of centered on ideas of, you know, home and family and what those things mean to right. us. 
I mean, it's always so hard to classify your own writing, right? Like most of us are yeah, just sitting yeah. down and writing the stories that we want to write. And it's really up to publishers and booksellers to tell us what, what they think they are, where they belong <laughs> in, the, in the stores. That's true. I want to remind everybody, uh, if you have a question that you would like Lisa to answer, post it in the chat and we will hope to get to as many as we can. Lisa, um, starting last month, the five of us began partnering with Parade.com and we have an essay in their online magazine each week. This week, my essay was about the value of um, reading and my personal essay was about being an early reader and the influence um, uh, that those children's books had on me. And I was thinking about how reading aloud to children pays off in so many ways. I know you've got a daughter, right? I do. Yeah. She's 15 years old now. So you probably aren't reading to her anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, we still read together. I still read to oh, my daughter. Oh. I've been reading to her since she was like, you know, a tiny baby that I brought home from the hospital. I've been reading to her every single day. Uh. And just recently, now that she's 15 and like super cool, um, <laughs> yeah. we, you know, we just recently stopped reading together every single Ooh. night, but we still do sometimes oh. when, when one of us needs I a little, love that. when one of us You'll needs start a little sharing books. You'll start yeah, sharing books. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, so I'm, I'm always, guessing that you, I'm guessing you read the books you read to her at bedtime were probably what a lot of Stephen King. Yeah, Stephen King, <laughs> Sheldon, you know, uh, things like things like that. I, that I was reading, like DC Andrews, like you know, my my mom was a my mom was a librarian, and my both my parents were like avid readers, and so there's always like these big bookshelves everywhere we lived, and uh, there is zero censorship in my house. So like, if I could reach it, I could read it. So I was reading things, much you know, those things at like a very inappropriately young. <laughs> well, that <laughs> explains a few things. Doesn't it? Right? <laughs> and I think my mom kind of thought a lot of it was going over my head, but you know, it, it wasn't. <laughs> and also like, you know, my mom is just like this great lover of story, you know, this is where I, mm -hmm. I got it from, of course, but you know, she also mm -hmm. loved movies. And my dad is like, you know, anti-fiction, anti-movies. So she always used to take me to the movies with her, like no matter how old I was. And so again, you know, wildly inappropriate. <laughs> Love um, it. What I couldn't understand was like, well, that was going to be okay. But, you know, I, I think that it just kind of, you know, um, it just, you know, it formed me really, yeah. you know, um, in, in many ways, my mom's love of, of books and stories. Well, I'm going to keep right. that in mind for when my grandchildren get older because I yeah. want to be the fun grandma. <laughs> <laughs> With my grandchildren, I it's it, it's really sweet because they when they come to visit me on the beach, we spend a lot of time looking at the sea turtle nests. So yeah. I have a picture book that I wrote with photographs of what the turtle team actually does on the beach oh, called Turtle Summer. Oh. And so when my children um, had children, they all had the book. And whenever anyone I know has a baby, they're going to get turtle summer. That's and they all come to visit and visit and see turtles. So it's a special treat in my family. That's wonderful. I love that. I was like you, Lisa, in that I have these pictures of, I mean, it must have been like the day we brought Wilhelm from the hospital and I'm like reading to him. Like I would read to him when he was in my belly, you know, <laughs> I was reading to him. So excited. Um, and I think one of my, like, one of the mom moments that I will never, ever forget, he was in preschool and his preschool teacher sent home one of those little Bob books, you know, that like you get the kids started reading on. Yeah. And he was very um, like type A and driven. I don't know where he gets it. It's so weird. Yeah, it's a mystery. mystery. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I thought, and I just remember being like, oh my God, this is going to go so poorly because he's going to want to read this book. And like, he doesn't know how to read. And, you know, he could do the thing where he would like recite the parts of the book. So we'd read a million times. Right. And we were sitting at the kitchen counter and he sat down and he opened the book and he started reading. It. And I was like, Wow. My child can read and I didn't <laughs> know it. Like his preschool <laughs> teacher did, but I didn't. And I just remember, and then I made him do it again and I was videoing it and like sending it to, my, to you know, all the grandparents. And I was like, yeah. oh my God. And it was, I will never forget it. I was so that's just, cute. That's awesome. it was amazing. That's awesome. yeah. it's oh cute. man. Yeah. Oh, that is really it's cool. It's such a gift, you know, that you give to your child because yeah. I mean, I good. often think about it. Like, you know, whenever somebody says like, Oh, I, I, you know, and people do say this even to writers like, oh, I don't read, which, yeah. you know, you might as well say something like, 
I don't breathe. Like right. I can't even, I can't even, I I can't even imagine what my like, life would be without without yeah. stories. And it's like it's a gift that yeah, you know, I gave to my daughter and my you know, my mom gave it to me and I gave it to my daughter. And I just think yeah. that it just you know, it, it broadens your world so much. You know, yeah. it's such a it's such a, a you know, it's such a, an, an open door into other lives and other places right. and um such an important, I think important you know, important thing to give your child. Absolutely. Yeah. And Christy, it, it's so funny that you mentioned reading to Will um, when you were pregnant with him, because I have such a memory of doing that with Noah. Um, I was such a weirdo that I bought headphones that went around my belly. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah. But so um, I recorded myself. And reading. strange. I, it's a, a little weird. You know, I'm, I'm the weirdo. And it's all right. Um, no, no, I, I, I no, I think it's Dude, I love that. Well, I so I recorded myself reading, um, reading like I don't know, maybe eight or ten children's books I liked, and I just played them on repeat when I was working because I felt like, well, I'm not really paying attention to him. Like, I mean, he was in my belly. I don't know what I thought I needed to be doing. <laughs> That's so, cute. so I, I would just play them from like the recordings on my cell phone into my belly. So yeah, he and I have always read together, and you know, um. Noah's five. He would be in pre-K this year, but we've kept him out of school this year, um, you know, it, at least so far sure. because of the pandemic. And one of the greatest gifts has been that this is the year um, he learned to read. And I've gotten mm. to witness that, um, nice. which is awesome. Like to see the, the, from the spark of interest to like now he's reading those, you know, those little phonics readers that like today he read me a story about Peppa Pig. And just about a month ago, he started writing his own little book. So this is called oh. The Day... The day Greeny and Bluey met, and you know what I love about this? He doesn't. He doesn't draw the pictures. It's just words. So like that's where. Wow. So he he nice. know he knows already at five that like words can take you places. That was so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the day Greeny. Proud Greeny mama, met. right? Yeah, there. I do. Feel really proud. just one motherhood is basically what happened. <laughs> I know. You just like, got the mommy crown. She's yeah. entertaining him while he's. In utero, well, and now he's writing books. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll wear that crown side by side with the big weirdo who has headphones on her belly. Crown. <laughs> so. I think the headphones are awesome. I read to my kids every night, and then during the day, and then, and I figured they would all grow up to be avid readers. I have an older daughter and two sons, and only my daughter is at the moment an avid reader. Mm -hmm. But we read everything from Goodnight Moon to Olivia to Eloise to Thomas the Tank Engine. Mm -hmm. And when my daughter was five years old, she looked at me and she said, I want to be a writer of books. Mm -hmm. And I know it's because she had two little brothers wow. and it was her only time alone with me, mm -hmm. right? I know y'all's kids have done this, Lisa too. One more book. Yeah. One more yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. One more book. Because they've got you. They have only yeah. you when you're reading that one more book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I just think reading reading to our little ones. Um, and now Megan and I will read a book at the same time, which you're probably starting to do with your 15 year old. That's right. And then we call yeah. and talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. When when Katie and Andy um were little, we started with Good Night Moon, which I'm generations of families have and I then the classics it. like madeline and they love the story of ping which was written in 1939 but they loved that book um and then their fave was harry the dirty dog which i bought for a dollar oh. at a library used book sale oh, and now my grandchildren molly and griffin are nine and eleven and they loved llama llama red pajama oh, those books by so anna funny. dudney and uh, Mo Willems, they like. I think children oh, Mo really Willems like is like a god in our so house. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mo Willems, don't let the pigeon drive the bus. That is the most subversive pigeon Words to ever. live by, truly. <laughs> yeah, do not let the pigeon drive the bus. Okay, oh, I think we're going to move along. Seems explanatory, obviously. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a pigeon is bad news, <laughs> Lisa. Um, I've read that you never try to put yourself in a box and critics call your writing style wildly experimental. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even know how to explain uh, confessions on the 745. So would you give us the elevator pitch? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. So when we first start confessions, 
um, we meet Selena and Selena has had a really bad day, like a terrible day, like the worst day ever. And she's, you know, missed her train home and she's in a really dark place when she finally makes it to her train station and she gets on the train. And of course, because she's had this horrible day, it stalls, it dies on the mm -hmm. tracks. She's gonna be even later getting home. She finds a seat next to a beautiful stranger and this stranger strikes up a conversation with a confession. And maybe it's, you know, the dark of the train or the drink she shouldn't have had or this terrible, awful day. But this confession leads Selena to share a secret of her own. And then the train comes back to life and Selena is headed back into the world and she's embarrassed, you know, like, oh my God, why did I tell this total stranger this really dark secret that I've never told anyone? And she hopes, she just really hopes that she is never going to see the beautiful stranger on the train ever again. But of course she will. And <laughs> that's the uh, premise for Confessions on the 745. Chill bones. Yes, Chill bones. really. <laughs> Such a great. I mean, you might as well have just reached in a hook and, you know, grabbed <laughs> right. every <laughs> single right. one of our <laughs> listeners out there. So in an interview I read, you said that you frequently start with an idea you're obsessed with mm -hmm. and that you let it build into something larger until you start to hear voices. And I assume you don't mean audibly because, you know, that's yeah. crazy. That's but crazy. It's not <laughs> no, no, that's not what I meant. No judgment. <laughs> you know, I know. If it is, then I think, okay, we're done. No, is that how you came up with the plot for Confessions on the 745? Did you start, what was the obsession you started with? And then which voices did you start to hear? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's exactly the way it works for me. I, I wind up getting like kind of semi-obsessed with something. In this case, there was an idea that had been kicking around in my head for a while. I'm not even sure where I heard it in the first place, but it was the idea that you can't con an honest man. And I thought, I like that, that. You know that that yeah, has the ring of that has the ring of truth to it, but you know nothing in human psychology is ever so simple. Um, and so it led me to do a lot of research about the confidence game, con artists, mm -hmm. and um, and and scams. And so I started, um, you know, and I had been sort of thinking about it for a while, and I brought it up in in, in a green room um, before a crime fiction panel, and one of my one of the women I was talking to said, uh, I don't know, she's like, that kind of sounds like victim blaming to me. And I was like, Interesting. yeah, I, I hear that, you know, so that was another piece that kind of went into my head. Mm -hmm. and so I get, you know, sort of obsessed and I'm reading and I run across a book called The Confidence Game by a writer named Maria Konnikova. And it's a very uh, detailed book about um, con artists, um, co you, know, com you know, common scams, the psychology of the con artist and the con. And wow. you know, I, I, I sort of came away from this book with a much more layered idea of, you know, the confidence game. And one of the things that she said was that, you know, most people think that they are immune to this. Like you're too smart, you're too worldly mm -hmm. to be con. Right. Scam. But the more sure you are of that fact, the more vulnerable you are yeah. to, to wow. these predators. And so that was really interesting. And so I came away from the book thinking, it's not so much that you can't con an honest man, it's that you can't con somebody who doesn't want something. And yeah. everybody yeah. wants something. And everybody wants something. Everybody That's wants something. Point. And these people are very, very good at figuring out what that thing is and giving mm. it to you so that you in turn give them what they were after all along. And so it was that idea that sort of drew me into the uh, confessions. And um, I, my, first voice, my first voice was Pearl. Mm. Um, and uh -huh. Selena was the, the, the very powerful second. So there were these two voices, these two women, uh, you know, a girl and a woman leading you know, very different lives. And um, I, you know, and I don't know how things are going to go when I start to write. I, I don't have an outline. I don't know what's gonna happen That's day to day or who's gonna show up or what they're gonna do. I certainly don't know how the book is gonna end, 
Um, so I just have to kind of find that, find wow. the story which I believe is there. I always believe it's there and I usually find it. So just keep doing it like that. Wow. I, I you know. At what, <laughs> at what point did Pop's voice come to you, Lisa? Um, Pop came, well, he is really sort of a, like an, like sort of an element of Pearl's life, right? So when we, right. First, meet, so when we first meet Pearl, um, she, the first thing she sort of tells us about herself is that she's a watcher, that mm -hmm. she likes to hide in the mm -hmm. shadows and that's where she sees what everybody else misses. That's where she sees what people, what people are when they don't think they're being observed. Uh, so Pop um, is sort of a little bit hard to talk about him without, you know, giving a lot of the right, story. Yeah. He's the first person that ever really sees her. And it surprises her to be seen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though their relationship is uh, a very dark one, and uh, tw and twisted in a in a number of different ways, he was really the first person to ever take care of her. Mm. You know, truly take care of her. You know, Stella, her mother is you know not abusive, but she's you know wild and disorganized and, and unpredictable. And her father, her biological father, is you know missing. He, she has no idea who he is or 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 where he is at the beginning of the book. Um, and so he is like even though he's in many, many ways, almost a predator, I think, you know, in his sort of dark heart, he truly, he truly loves her and she yeah. loves him. And it, it was just that relationship, that really complicated relationship that intrigued me. And that's yeah. sort of how, you know, I just kind of followed them through the book that way. That's fascinating. Yeah. But I have to say that when I was listening to you talk about the psychology of the con, yeah. it made me understand maybe for the first time how so many people fall prey to oh, yeah. telemarketing scams Absolutely. and the letters that come in the mail telling you your social security yeah. screwed up. And they, they're so effective at it and they, get, they yeah. ask the right yeah. questions. And also, you know, people, when they have been scammed, and this is another big part of the problem, when they have been scammed, there's so much shame because there's yeah, such a idea parents. that you that you you were so foolish and how could you have fallen for this and this is like it's out there everybody knows there's no Nigerian prince that you know needs your help <laughs> right like it's everybody not? knows that it's and social security like, one oh my god yes yeah, so there's, like, there's so much shame um, yeah. attached to yeah. it when you have been conned that a lot of people don't ever report it. And so yes. things, yeah. you know, they go on, and, and it's always, they're also very slip. They're you know they're very slippery, yeah. and it's mm -hmm. not like a it's not a robbery. It's not a it's not a smash and grab. You know, it's yeah. a dance, and you yeah. participate in it, and you know that you participate. When it's over, you know that you participated in it, and so there's a tremendous amount of shame that keeps people from ever yeah. saying this happened to me. And so it you know it goes on, and people don't get caught. And you know, you truly have been prey. But critics have compared this wonderful book to Patricia Highsmith's mm. classic, Strangers on the Train, which was made into a Hitchcock film. Mm -hmm. And also contemporary thrillers like Paula Hawkins' The Girl on the Train and Donald Westlake's The Grifters and Harlan Coben's The Stranger. And yet, Lisa, your book is totally unique and fresh. So my question is, can you talk about how you can take this traditional thriller trope and make it your own? Although you've already given us a couple of insights into how, but I'd like to hear how you take this thriller and decide this, uh, how do you make it fresh? Right, well, it has to be yours, right? Otherwise you can't ever write it. You know, you can't, you know, the, you, you have five writers and there could be one idea and there there's gonna be five, there's gonna be five different, but you know, there's gonna be five different books because everything that you write, if you're writing from an authentic space comes from all of your, you know, this, uh, this wonderful amalgamation of your imagination, your experiences, your ideas, your, you know, your fantasies, your dreams, you know, everything is like kind of that. And, um, you know, so, you know, it come, the, the inspiration for this book came from, you know, my obsession with confidence games. And of course, you know, there's so many, 
great books that you mentioned, like The Grifters and, um, you know, and Patricia Highsmith and, and all, all these books are, you know, they're, they're well established in the, in the consciousness of, of readers, especially crime fiction readers. But, you know, I'm always going to bring my own thing to that yeah. story, you know, so it's really, I think it's, I think it would be hard to, to copy a book or an idea, even if, even if you wanted to, you know, you couldn't really, you couldn't really sure. do that. You know that that idea for me of two strangers meeting like in a liminal space has always been uh, kind of a fascinating idea. You know, I feel like when you're traveling, especially you know, like traveling is like this liminal space. It's you're not the person that you were when you left where you were, and you're not the person yeah. that you're going to be when you get where you're going, mm -hmm. you're just in this like sort of space where there's this tremendous amount of energy. And we all know that we've like oh, yeah. sort of wound up next to somebody yeah. and it could, yeah. and it could be, and it maybe is most often one of those like, Oh my God, moments where you just need to put your headphones in. Like, I can't talk to you, but sometimes mm -hmm. there's like this electricity and yeah. you know, you know that everything in your mm -hmm. life and everything in their life has brought you you know, to this space and there must yeah. be an energy yeah. to that or a reason for that. And so yeah. that was really like, so it wasn't really um, strangers on a train or the grifters or any of those that were the inspiration, but mm -hmm. just that idea of, you know, you're vulnerable and you're in this liminal space and what the energy is there and what can happen. And so yeah. everything yeah. else from there is me. So you could never, you know, you can never really, right. you know, like there are as many, there are as many stories around a central theme as there are people. Yeah, and it's true. To, yeah. I think, and I think this is more just that you're being compared to the great classics. Which is, yes. you know, humbling <laughs> and, <laughs> and, awesome. and kind, very kind. <laughs> you know, Lisa, we had, we had Kristen Hanna on our show last week yeah. and she, Spoke about throwing unbearable challenges at her protagonists. So it seemed to me in reading this book that you threw a lot at Selena. You put her through a lot. <laughs> Obviously, that's, that's an understatement of the evening, right? <laughs> so, you know, it, when Kristen was talking with us uh, last week, it, it, it sounded like what she was saying is she was making a very conscious, deliberate choice to continue asking herself, how can I raise the stakes? How can I make things worse? For you, was that as conscious? I, and I'm especially curious about the answer since you were just talking about the way you plot your books, that you start with these characters, you hear these voices, and then you just go. Are you consciously asking yourself every step of the way, how can I raise the stakes? How can I make it worse? Or does that just evolve because of these characters you've created? Yeah, no, I'm never thinking anything like that. I I mean, I, I, and of course, you know, I will say that, you know, I've been a writer all my life. I've been a writer since I was a kid. I've been a reader since I was a kid. My education is centered on writing and the novel is where is my voice, right? Like that's where, you know, after studying poetry and screenwriting and, you know, playwriting and journalism, you know, it was very clear to me when I just, when I discovered that the novel is my writer's voice, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been doing this, you know, in one way or another for most of my life. Um, so I think in many, in, in many senses, I have like just sort of internalized that form, you know, like it, it's the way my, brain works right like i'm always looking for the story and telling the story but when i'm writing i'm like in a completely other brain um and i have no access to these choices like i don't choose my characters i don't choose their names i don't feel that i do yeah. right i do but i don't experience it that way yeah. and i'm never asking questions like how can I raise the stakes? Where can I bring this twist? Like, there's nothing like that for me. It is all a hundred percent organic, and wow. um, everything, every element of my plot flows from character, mm -hmm. and and the and those characters are, and I am in that space with them. I am not above yeah. it on the outside, moving pieces around the board. I'm not that's doing right. that. I'm not doing that. I'm yeah. in it. So later, right, after the first draft is done yeah. and the book is written, and there's an editorial process that, you know, as a professional writer, I, you know, subject my book to at least two to three editorial drafts before I ever turn it into my editor. Okay. 
And so at that time, when I'm reading my own book, I'm going to ask myself this question about every scene. I'm going to say, does this scene advance plot or character? Hopefully both. Okay. Yeah. Right. So every scene that I have written, every piece of story that I have put onto the page is going to be subjected to that in the editor in the editorial phase. Um, but in the writing phase, yeah, you know, I just don't. I just don't have any of those thoughts. I, I'm sure I mm -hmm. am having them, but they're on a sub, they're 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 deep subconscious. subconscious. Yeah, they're deep yeah. subconscious. Do you feel like that's developed as I mean, as you've written more and more books, has that ability for your subconscious to do that for you evolved and made you over time a better, more intuitive writer? I I honestly well, so so my first novel, I. The, the first novel I published, I began writing when I was 19 years old. Wow. And, wow. I, and I just I just turned 50 last year. So I, I hope that the book I started writing when I was 19 years old <laughs> in quality is <laughs> unrecognizable from the book that I I just turned in. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All these many years, right? After yeah. 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 yeah. hours, whatever amount of hours True. I have mm -hmm. devoted to honing a craft that I have been, you know, working on my entire life. Nice. I hope that I am a better writer today than I was when I was 19 year old. I mean, like sort of, you know, God help me if I'm not. My process has honestly always been, has always been the same. It's yeah. never, it's never really, it's never really changed. I've always written the way I write, but I'm hope, I hope I'm doing it better. Yes. <laughs> and that's really the thing that like always, motivates me like i'm not motivated by um you know bestseller lists or reviews or or anything what i'm motivated yeah. is every day is that i i feel like i believe i can get up every day and be a better writer than i was yesterday yes. i truly mm -hmm. believe that right. you know and so that's the that's the fire in the belly for me like that's what brings awesome. me back to the page that's awesome mm -hmm. i love that wow that's so well said and yeah such a good goal to strive for. Is know, that all you? That's the yeah. only thing you control. I mean, we all know yeah. that in this yeah. business. So it's true. Literally, it's the only thing you control is what you bring to the page. Yep. So Absolutely. true. So true. Um, well, sort of along that line, um, Selena, that your protagonist, seems to be caught in this velvet cage of her own making. You know, she has this seemingly storybook life with a great job and beautiful children and, you know, the things that we all really want, want, um, but her marriage is already starting to develop some cracks. Yeah. And it, <laughs> <laughs> you, can that. you can say that. Um, but it seems like you have a lot to say about happy families in this book and also about the role that social media plays mm -hmm. in that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I am, um, you know, so Selena is like one of those women, like, you know, she's any of us or she's anybody yeah. that, you know, she's like one of these super women that like um, our culture is so good at producing, mm -hmm. right? She's got, the <laughs> perfect, she's got the perfect marriage and she's got the perfect house and she's got the big job and she's got the, you know, the, the gorgeous children. And, you know, she even thinks of herself as being like, Instagrammable, you know, like she's <laughs> Instagrammable. <laughs> That's a great line. And, um, and she puts that out there, you know, very much so. And she's very invested in it. You know, she's very invested in this idea of herself as being perfect. And it's not even anything that she, I think, consciously has chosen or consciously mm -hmm. wants, but she is very, you know, very invested in that facade that she has put up. And so much so that she has, um, you know, allowed her marriage to kind of rot underneath mm -hmm. the underneath the shingles, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot there's a lot of rot there, and uh, and 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 she's also very um, tied up in it because she can't even bring herself to tell anyone. She can't tell her best friend. She can't tell her sister. She can't tell her mother because she doesn't want 
to shatter this image, this perfect image of Selena and Graham. You know, this like, you know, she's like, they're, they're basically like tearing each other's throats out. And she's like posting pictures of them, like having a family walk in the park, <laughs> yeah. right? And, uh, and, and so she's yeah. so, she's so invested in that. And I think that, that is one of the reasons that, you know, she's so vulnerable to Mark, to Martha, that, that, and, you know, in that moment on the train, because she's like, she has to tell somebody like all the stuff that's going on within her. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think social media, you know, I think, I think social media has a lot to answer for in certain ways. You know, I think it's rewired us in, in, in ways that we could never have predicted. And that, you know, there's so much of, you know, these, these curated moments that are put out there, right? Yeah. What, why we all know that real life is the life that's being lived between those filtered and curated shots that you yeah. had the time to post on Instagram and then like wrote your little blurb or whatever, what you wrote about like your perfect self. And then the people on the other end, are thinking, <laughs> they're, they're looking at the, this feed of perfection and comparing it to their very messy, complicated, three-dimensional yes. lives. And yes. it, it's toxic or, or it can be. Yes. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm always I'm always interested in in questions of technology. You know, they always figure very um, very prominently, especially in the last I would say three or four books. You know, this question about what te technology is doing to our sense of identity yeah. and how we relate to each other. So along those lines, I mean, do you think that social media has made voyeurs out of all of us? Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> voyeurs and Definitely. narcissists. And, narcissists. and um, you know, and I think that it hasn't made yet yeah, to be to be clear, I don't think it's made anything out of us. I think it's just exposed some of the fractures mm -hmm. and some of the tendencies that, you know, we already had. You know, there is always a tendency that hide behind an armor of everything's okay i'm fine it's perfect right there is that tendency to yeah. hide behind that in in general and this just you know it has amped it up to a new level and then you know and we are looking um but we're at each other much more than ever before but we're not really seeing what's true yeah you know we're just seeing what people have chosen to show and sometimes I think the messy real life behind the scenes pictures are like the most curated. <laughs> yeah, the most curated well. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, your messy kid is so cute, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we've got some questions from viewers. I've got another another question I wanted to ask. And, you know, uh, actually, I think probably we're all curious. Lisa, could you talk about your publishing journey? Because you were in the business side of book publishing to Absolutely. start with, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was, you know, I was a writer as a kid. My mom was a librarian and she always knew kind of what I was. My dad, on the other hand, was an engineer. Mm. And so, you know, I had aspirations early and I was like, is this something I could do? You know, my dad was like, no, it really <laughs> <laughs> it's not a job, you know, <laughs> get, get a real job. And it was like, here's the deal. You know, you're covered for four years of college. I got, I got your back, but when you graduate, you are off the payroll. So, um, you know, you can take basket weaving for all I care. Um, <laughs> but you're going to need to get a job that it, even if it doesn't pay well, at least it pays every two weeks. So, you know, even though I knew this is what I was and it's all I wanted and everything, I did my entire education writing. When I graduated, not surprisingly, I didn't really have the confidence to, <laughs> to actually try, even though I'd already started my first novel when I was 19 years old, like still in school. So I went into publishing. And to be honest, you know, it was unfortunate that I happened to be like really, really good at my job as a book publicist. So my job just kept getting like bigger and bigger and bigger oh. and the time that I spent writing got smaller and smaller and smaller until I just reached a point in my life when I wasn't writing at all. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I had a moment where I was like, okay, everything about my life is wrong. I was with the wrong guy, yeah. not my husband who I'm with now for 20 years, but the wrong guy at the time, everybody's been with the, that guy, right? Like mm -hmm. not the right guy. And I uh, was giving like 110% of myself to, um, a job that I didn't didn't love, and that yeah. the only thing that I ever wanted, uh, I was just letting it go, 
And so that was the moment where I got really, really serious about my writing. You know, I was like, I'm going to be able to live with spectacular crash and burn failure, but I'm not going to be able to live with a slow fade. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the courageous choice of success, isn't it? Well, yeah. yeah I mean, so. that's, that's all you need to do to write, to be a writer is to actually write, you know? So that's when I started writing every day. And uh, I took me another year from that, from that time to finish the book that I had started when I was 19. So the book that's that I amazing. started when I was 19, I finished when I was 29. Wow. 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 And so even when I finished it, I was like, I still didn't know what to do with it. You'd think after having been in publishing all this time and like now, you know, people in publishing publish all the time, but then it wasn't really like that. You know, it was like, I was kind of a closet writer, you know, <laughs> it was like, it, like, it's almost embarrassing to be working in publishing and be like, oh, you know, you're at dinner with Tom Clancy, like, oh, I'm a writer too, Tom. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, cute. <laughs> that's so cute. Yeah. yeah. That's so nice. that's so cute. No, I was just like, I know, I, I went, I, I wanted to go to, down to Florida to, uh, to visit a friend, and I was at Sloppy Joe's in Key West. Key West. Yeah. And that's where I met my, uh, my husband, Jeff. Oh, wow. And, you know, usually those relationships that begin with Sloppy Joe's are a little bit more short term. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, <laughs> like sort of a one in a million. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We just celebrated our twentieth wedding anniversary, so oh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, congratulations. Okay. congratulations! Thank you. Well, Lisa, each week we support an independent bookstore, and yeah. this week you chose Tumble of Books. Ah, uh, yes. And founder Elsa's. Valentine, who's so great, was the longtime events director of Malaprops up right. in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah. And I love her and I have done events with her. And she moved to St. Pete, St. Petersburg with her partner and co-store owner, Candace Anderson. And by the way, we all look forward to forward visiting the store at some point in the future. Yes, and please. And Tombolo Books features all genres from biography, memoir, and science to gardening, cooking, poetry, and of course, fiction. The store offers an expansive children's section with a cozy reading nook for parents and children. And you can enjoy your visit and take all the time you want. It's a wonderful place. Customers were all customers will also find a healthy section of books, both fiction and nonfiction, by Florida authors and all about the state of Florida. So if you want to order Lisa's books tonight or ours, offer they're offering a 10% discount on books by Lisa and us. Discount will be given at the check out and I don't see that we have a code so we don't need one your, no, we don't need don't a code need tonight so just get your 10% discount <laughs> don't even have to right. remember anything that's so yeah, great that's point. Point. Okay. Done. Hi. <laughs> they're the best they're it's such a great store I love it there so much they're so supportive and it's just such a nice place I love it and hello again they're Elsa great. Elsa yeah. Okay, so now we've got a lot of people are posting questions mm -hmm. for Lisa. Um, Patty, are you going to read her a couple a uh, question or so? Okay, Lisa, I'm so glad they asked this because I wanted to ask you this. So Diana Kuhn McGoldrick said, how you said you didn't plot that you don't, you know, have an outline that you work from. Right. How far into a story does the way it will come to a close? become clear to you? Mm. Great question. Mm. Yeah. I know. I was like, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Diana. Diana's good at the question. <laughs> <is>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the story usually just kind of continues to build continues to build on itself. And then I'm probably about three quarters of the way through when th when I start to see the shape of the end. And this is a, the, around the time where I wind up having a lot of 3 a.m. wake ups. Which oh, is no, those very, <laughs> which we I know those. Is, is yeah, oh, the worst. yeah, I mean, everybody, like, 3 a.m. is like the witching hour, right? Like, for yes. everything, every worry that you have in your life. Yes. But, like, it's, um, it's for me, like, that's the, you know, the time when I wake up, especially towards the end of the book. 
um, when I, I just feel like a lot of things are, are working themselves out during the day when I'm, you know, when I'm, when I'm not writing, when I'm exercising, when I'm cooking. And then, and then of course, unfortunately when I'm sleeping and so yeah. I, and then it will just kind of wake me up and I'll just wake up thinking, Oh my God, that's it. You know, like I can't even <laughs> tell you how many times that's <laughs> happened, you know, when I'm sleeping or when I'm on the treadmill or like whatever, you know, whatever it happens to be. And it's usually like about three quarters of the way that I'm starting to see that shape and that things really get very, very intense. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, and it's also like to the point where like, I will have written something, you know, like on page 50 that I didn't even know why at the time. Yeah. And then I'll just be like, Oh, Right. That's why, you know, and I, cause I know, I know enough, I trust myself enough to leave it there, even though I don't a hundred percent understand it. And then of course, mm -hmm. while I'm, while I'm writing, you know, when I start my writing day, I generally reread what I wrote the day before. So there's always a lot of editing that goes in to that as well, because, you know, you can never be reading your own work and not rewriting it. Right. I mean, yeah, no way. It's not, it's not even possible. So even when it's in the book, Right. Yeah, that's the worst. And you're reading, reading. Oh, why? Oh, I should have done that. Yeah. 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 It's way too late for way too late for that. But I think all of us would probably rewrite everything. I know I would forever yeah. and ever. Right. Yes. And then actually, I mean, Lisa, it's like you just know what I'm going to ask you because you segued so well into this. Um, Kathleen Bridge wants to know what your typical writing day is like, and do you write seven days a week? And she also said she loved meeting you at her independent bookstore, the Vera Beach Book Center, which oh, I know we oh, all really love. Oh, nice, Cynthia. I've been going there forever and ever. Hi, thanks for um, for asking. Yeah, I write. You know, I write pretty much every day. Um, my, you know, sort of my golden creative hours are from five a.m. to noon. Um, I'm a mom, so I don't get that every day. You know, of course, there's like, you know, the dog threw up at four o'clock or right. mm -hmm. sick or whatever. But, the, you know, I the, my bet my happy place is to roll out of bed, like to my desk, like when I'm as yeah. close to that dream yes. frame mm -hmm. yes. as possible. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, things have shifted a little bit during the pandemic. And then also now my daughter goes to she has to be at school by by 720. So Oh. Six o'clock, we're having breakfast and having like that yeah. time together before she goes to school. So I've, you know, since the pandemic, I've really treated her school day, whether it's virtual or she's now actually in physical school. I treat her school day as my work day. That, oh my that's, not, day. that's not yeah. ideal. Ideal is for me to wake up at 5 a.m. Yeah. and work until noon. And that yeah. that is the ideal. That is the ideal situation for me. Yeah. But, you know, I, I ideals are not reality Ideally, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you, write, you write when you can write not when you wish you were writing <laughs> Yeah. My ideal is like 11.30 p.m. to like 3 a.m. Like oh, what you're yeah. talking oh, about, God. like that not twilight, me. but on the opposite end. But like, I mean, yeah. I can't, that's not like a real person's life. Right. right. I mean, you oh, can't gosh. do that. Right. I can't do that. <laughs> Someday you might be able to, and, yeah. you know, but you know, when you have a, you know, when you have like rug rats running around, yeah. you know, that's, <laughs> it's like, you don't want to miss that, you know, like no. that's five, yeah. that's five yeah. minutes of your yeah. life, right? Sleeping so. till 11 a.m. is like not a thing anymore. <laughs> so Christy, you're going, you're get, you're quitting writing when I'm getting up to write. When Lisa and yeah, I are getting I, up to write, oh, it's yeah. crazy! I could never do that. No, so Lisa, <laughs> Lisa, our readers, many of whom are also writers, love to hear writing tips from our guest authors. Mm -hmm. Do you have a writing tip you'd like to share with us today? Yes, I, I do. Let me think about this for a second. I usually just say, you know, don't, don't be precious about it you know I love that. don't don't look for you yeah. know that perfect moment when the yeah. muse comes and all your laundry is done and you have <laughs> yeah. the perfect writing space and the you know and complete silence like don't don't wait for that you know my yeah. first book started um on a napkin that i took out of the, glo the glove compartment of a car 
while I was sitting and waiting yeah. for my friend to be done with whatever it was he was doing. I can't even remember. So like there, you know, when, when it, you should just write, right? Like that's like the main thing. But you know, when you're, when you have a job and you have kids, if you, if you still have that burning desire to write, if you have like a story that's in you and, and, and you've always wanted to do it, there's, all, there's really only one way. And you, you have to schedule the time and honor the schedule yeah. mm -hmm. in the same way that you would schedule the time to do anything else that's important to you, because there really is no other way to write a novel than to write it. And there's no other way, no other way. to write yes. unless you've scheduled the time to do it and you've honored that time. Like when you get that time and you, you know, you're not mm -hmm. Facebook stalking your ex or <laughs> you know, cat videos on Twitter, you know, just write the time. So, Schedule the time and honor the schedule. It's not easy, but it is it is simple. Well put. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, you've given us a lot of writing tips all night long. But another question we like to ask our guests is, what are you currently reading? So, Lisa, do you have a book you'd like to recommend to all of us? Yes, I. So I, and I, and it's also exciting because I'll also be speaking to her next week at uh, Mysterious Galaxy books um i have right here uh Ooh. her dark lies by so Allison. jc is i know some of you guys know her she's she's so amazing she's such a, she's a, a wonderful generous and super kind person she's also a mega talented writer and yeah. um this book is just very elegant and dark and twisty and it's like you know, the wedding of the year at like, you oh, know, good. this island in Italy and, you know, the bride and the groom, they both have really, really dark secrets. And, you know, there's a storm coming and like, really, what could go wrong? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be fine. Yeah, yeah it'll be you know? yeah. It'll be great. No, no, it's good. It's all going to go off without a hitch. They live it has to be a happy ever. ending. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. No, it is, I've read it too. It is truly, fantastic. Truly, it's truly yeah. riveting. And, you know, of course, we all, we all love our friends and, you know, we all try to support each other. But, you know, JT truly is a tremendous talent. And uh, this was a, a fantastic book. I, I loved every page. Thank you. I could not agree more. So I'm going to toss out a book, Rec. Um, including JT's Her Dark Lies. Um, and that is a book that just came out yesterday called A Boob's Life. Yes. <laughs> All right. That's and awesome. it is written by Leslie Lear. And she is an amazing writer. And I first came in contact with her because she had written a modern love article about mm -hmm. how she had I fallen in her. love and married her husband and, and they got married and she got breast cancer. Oh. And the article was about how he got more than he bargained for. Oh. And this book is, it, it's funny, it's vulnerable, and it explores America's obsession with <laughs> <laughs> so, I just wanted to tell you all about it. Awesome. And it's been optioned for um, film or TV, I think, right? It's been optioned by HBO Max with Selma Hayek. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Leslie. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's that's a big announcement. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Anybody else have a book you want to recommend? Um, I Actually, could, I, I do, but I don't have the cover with me. So what, I'll hold it off till next week. There's so many. Okay. So many. Okay. Well, we've got a few more announcements we want to tell you about, but stay with us because you don't want to miss the last question for Lisa. Uh, Christy, I think maybe has something to say. That's me. Yes. Um, I don't know if you guys know about our podcasts. If you don't, you need to know about them. Um, not only are our shows on our podcast, but now we have extra interviews. So make sure you check them out. Um, I recently interviewed um, the author of the new Reese Witherspoon pick, Outlaw. Um, it was she was amazing. Uh, Patty and Mary Kay um, interviewed book influencers Carol Fitzgerald and Robin Hominoff, so you don't want to miss that one. And Kristen and Mary Kay just interviewed um, Tana French. So we have a lot of really great episodes coming up that you don't want to miss. So you can subscribe and listen wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you're enjoying it, rate us and review us and follow us. 
And I'm here to remind you, not about all those great podcasts, thank you, Christy, <laughs> but to remind you about our featured independent bookseller of the week, which is Tumbelo Books, the locally owned indie bookstore in St. Petersburg, known for its helpful staff. Get 10% off with the code. We do have a code. We lied about not having oh, a code. Oh, there is a code. We oh. have a code. And it is FF10 this week. For our guest, Lisa Unger's book, Confessions on the 745, as well of, as our recent upcoming books. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again to our partner, Mama Geraldine, maker of the country's best-selling cheese straw, and my personal favorite, pecan cinnamon cookies, and our partner, Page One Books, where real true book lovers hand curate selections they know that you would love. And speaking about books, our book club, Friends in Fiction official book club, is doing amazing things. First of all, they just passed the 4,000 member mark. Woohoo! Yay! Amazing. amazing. Brenda and Lisa, who run the program. And this month, they'll be reading my novel, The Book Club, appropriate for a book club. Mm -hmm. So you can visit by going to the Friends in Fiction official book club on Facebook. And I'll be joining them on March 15th for a discussion. And next week, no biggie, March 10th, <laughs> we, we're going to be having the book launch party for Patty's highly anticipated Yay! Surviving Yay! Savannah's release. So, yep, it's the first, this is the first Fab Five release out of the shoot. <laughs> and it'll be Patty's. Because we just pump them out like that, you know, just one after the other. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to miss you. You do not want to miss us next Wednesday night. And now we have one more question for Lisa. Lisa, you know, reading Confessions on the Seven Forty Five during this pandemic year, um, the, we've been wearing our protective masks. Mm -hmm. But in Confessions, which was completed before, right before we knew about COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about the mask we all wear and also about blinders. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, that's definitely a, a big theme of confessions, you know, that, um, you know, Selena, it's true of Selena, of course, you know, she she's wearing a mask. She has a facade that she puts forth of her life. And certainly Graham has one face that um, he's showing the world and, you know, another another face behind that. And and uh, and Martha you know, she she's sort of the the ultimate. Um, I guess even more than somebody who's wearing a mask, she, she's a changeling. She sort of becomes somebody different and something different at, at every at every phase of her life in the books, in the book. And I think also, you know, especially Selena um, definitely has has blinders on about her life. You know, she's there are things that she sort of willfully doesn't want to see and doesn't want to acknowledge. And I think that, you know, that's probably true for for all of us in in different mm -hmm. in different areas. You know, we're you might be one person at work and you might be one person with your children and you might be another person with your spouse, you know, to a certain degree, this is a, this is a normal thing. Um, of course, in confessions, you know, we're taking it up, we're taking up, taking it up a level, you know, the masks are a little bit darker and, you know, the blinders are a little bit more willful than, than hopefully we're, we're experiencing in our, in our real lives. That's a great, ex a great explanation. All right. So tonight we were talking about confessions on the 745 with best-selling author, Lisa Unger. Thanks Lisa for being with us tonight. Thank you, I just want you to know I will I will never look at another stranger on the train in the same way after tonight. <laughs> Don't talk to strangers. <laughs> yes. Stranger please, danger is real. Yeah. Stranger danger. Yeah, please, please go to our indie bookstore tonight, partner, and make sure you've gotten Lisa's book, her front list, and her back list. We would love it if you would treat yourself to our books, especially our Patty whose book comes out next week. Thank you, Lisa, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, guys. Thank Thank you so much for Take having care. Me. So Thanks much for fun. coming. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Uh, <laughs> um, now, you guys, everybody run out. 
or you can stay put for our after show. But we hope you'll run out to Tom Below Books and grab Confessions on the 745. Pre-order any of ours. Join us, Friends in Fiction, on our Facebook page, YouTube, and on Parade.com's Facebook page, where I wrote this week's essay. Give our podcasts a listen now with original new interviews. And don't forget, we're on Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye, everybody. Oh, that was great. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. She was here. Oh, Hello. I forgot Kristen had to leave. She had an event. Yeah. I was like, where yeah, did she had another event? Where did she Kathy, I see what you mean about, you know, keeping the light on. That was the psychological thriller times 10. I mean, wow. Even the thing about the cons. Wow. Yeah. I got a con in yeah, the mail today. Yeah, you did. Yeah, something about my bank statements or something. And I thought, Marcus, take a look at this. This doesn't seem right. I had what someone call me from like what they're doing now is they are um, hacking into your bank's actual phone number. So I had a call oh. come through to me from my bank's phone number. And fortunately it was like kind of late at night and I thought it was a little bit weird. And mm. they were like, we need to verify some charges. And I was like, mm, I'm going to hang yeah. up and call back. And I hung up and called back and they were like, Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a scam. And they were like, okay, everybody. That's the word of the, the, the lesson of today. Hang up yeah. and call back. Don't give yeah. it out over the phone. Yeah, and the number is always on the back of your credit card. Um, and then you just know it's the right number. But I had it saved. I had my bank like saved in my phone. And so it popped up on my phone as them. So, I mean, that any other time. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. My, uh, my in-laws one time got a call from somebody who, said, who pretended to be my son and said, I'm in trouble. And I don't want my parents to know. Yeah. yeah, that's a classic. I don't want con. mom and dad to know I'm in trouble. Will you please send money to get me out of, I've been arrested, whatever it is. And of course, my mother-in-law immediately knew that that was crazy. And yet my father-in-law was like, we've got to send money. we got to call Pat and Patty. Thomas is in big trouble. And she was like, yeah, no, he's at home. He's good. Like, I know. Talk about preying on the vulnerability. That's of horrible. The yeah, yeah, that's horrible. Yeah, that's why uh, you know, thrillers was, scare me. I can't read those at night. Know, this well, this one, this one um, is so well done. I it love is. the way it is. she talks about who Selena is in the margins. Like mm -hmm. she's coming home from work. She's had a terrible day at work, and she's coming home, and she's going what before she goes in the house and becomes a mom. Mm. it's like this little sliver is for me and who am I in this little sliver? Um, and I thought it was so well done. And of course the whole time when she's toying with the idea of, of um, the stranger on the train starts texting her mm. and she knows it's a bad idea to text her back. Um, her best friend says, don't text her back. Her lawyer says, run away but some there's this pull and um so it's really well done but yeah i'm oh i've always been fat maybe it's you know my former police reporter mm -hmm. um background but uh cons and confidence games kind of are fascinating to me mm. well and I for love something go ahead sweetie there you go i was gonna say for something so twisty i can't believe she doesn't plot I know. Yeah. That's like, that's surprising. What? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I mean, I'm a non-plotter, so like I don't know, but I would just think for something where you you know you have to kind of get to a certain place and yeah. there's a lot of twists and Drop turns along the way. Yeah. I mean right. I thought that was that's worse without a net. Yeah. I it's always thought books like that were tautly plotted. Like the twist and then the twist and then the twist. I always assumed mm -hmm. they had their twists yeah. lined up, All right? Yeah. yeah.
But I was actually thinking about, you know, what we all write and how, even though they're not twisty psychological thrillers, I wouldn't have like really put it into words this way, but I feel like in a lot of ways, we're always writing about who our characters are in those fringe hours or like who they are in that, you know, you're who they are with their family, who they are with their friend, who they, who you are when you're. And so sometimes, you know, like my editor will say, they're thinking too much or cut that. But I'm like, no, because you're a totally different person or like, oh, have this in conversation. But the things Mm -hmm. that you think to yourself are so often things that you would never say to Anyone. Anybody else. Those quiet, introspective, yeah. often reactions to some action that just. Yeah. Happened. And a lot yeah. of times, like, they're just not something you would say out loud. So I think it's really fascinating to think how that isn't necessarily genre specific, but that we're all kind of doing that. Yes. Yeah. Krista and I um, interviewed uh, Tata French. Now, yeah. Um, how was For that? the podcast. It was really interesting. She and she kind of does the same thing. She just, you know, um, it's whatever she's been thinking about and it just, she just starts writing. So, um, and of course we all think, oh, thriller writers, they have it all, they have it on a, on a bar chart and a graph and they have it storyboarded, but I think everybody does it differently. Mm -hmm. That's what's always so interesting. It is. And I think the, uh, when she said she follows her obsession, I was going to say to her, but she was talking so beautifully about it. The other word I would use for that is curiosity, Mm. right? When we're curious Mm -hmm. about something, that's how I always, almost always fall into my story. Mm -hmm. There's something I'm curious about. Then I Mm -hmm. get a little more curious and then a little more curious and then a little more curious. And the next thing you know, you've fallen down a research rabbit hole and there's a story. You do it like like that painting you saw. Yeah. Isn't that what Greer McAllister was talking about the other night when she said that it's always those empty gaps that we yeah. find most curious yes. about? Yes, yes. The question mark in there. Like, mm-hmm. and someone needs to answer the question. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, um, I, uh, the question I wanted to ask her, she, in one of the uh, interviews I read with her, she said the idea can come from everywhere. And she, and one idea for a book she got, and I guess she wrote it, was from a piece of junk mail. <gasps> wow. <laughs> That's awesome. I know. When people when people say, where do you get your ideas? I'm like, hello world. <laughs> yeah. And it is, you know, I feel like I've been counting on reading a lot more, not necessarily books, but just like magazines and like what's going on in the world. And because yeah. I'm not out there every day living this exciting life. I'm not all, you know, no, none of us are. I mean, we're Especially not of, now. Yeah. No. I mean, we're not, you know, we're meeting close, all these right? interesting people and on airplanes and speaking. And I mean, we're just not being, our creativity has to come from some different places. Well, I Christy, I am never talking to anybody on the plane again or a train or yeah. anything else. Okay. I want to tell them just don't confess anything. Yeah. Right. Just don't tell no, them your sorry. secret. But do you ever, like, are there any, um, like, plane or train or whatever conversations that you've ever had that you remember, like a person that you met on a plane that you were like, yeah. it stuck with you? Oh, I met a heartthrob once. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, were we destined to meet? I better not talk to you anymore. So my heart was going. <laughs> and I've been married for a long time. <laughs> that has not happened to me. Really? Oh, yes. No. But I was good. I can't think I of did anybody. Not I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure I have talked to strangers on the plane, um, but I really can't think. I can't. That's how I met Andy McDowell. That's right. <laughs> so maybe I should talk to people on the plane. I met a guy on a plane one time, and it was so fortuitous because I was um, writing The Secret of Southern Charm, and the Sloan's husband is like missing in action, and um, and he like told me all of these like really interesting stories about being a soldier and my heart didn't pitter pat. We weren't like destined to read or anything, but he really helped me with my book. I mean, we talked as the flight was two hours. We talked the whole time and I was like, That's taking amazing. Notes. it was really That's great. great. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get out there and do that soon. I know. Yeah. I know right now it's like, what are you going to be inspired by? Well, I was inspired by the run to the grocery store. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> on the way to the mailbox there was yeah. this really cool so dog i don't know yeah. i sat beside a psychic I on got, a plane oh sorry 
but I'm not going to tell y'all. I'll, I'll, I'll one you day on a show. This before. You yeah, mentioned well, this before. One day on a show, I'll tell you all about it because it was like the craziest. Right. I think I've told y'all, but I don't think I've, maybe I, I want to hear it. You told us We've about heard bits it. And pieces. You didn't say what she yeah. said. I met a psychic in a bar, a famous bar in New York, gosh, decades ago. It was the Lion's Head, which was the yeah. village hangout for writers. It's It's gone now. But a, a friend who was working for the New York Daily News at the time took me there. And we were sitting at the bar having a drink. And a guy came up. And uh, to we did, totally did not. The two of us did not look like women you would hit on. But for <sighs> some reason, this guy was hitting on us. And he was like, I um, I'm a, uh, I read poems, among other things. And let me read your poem. I'm like, All right, whatever. Go away. What a pickup line. He, um, like, yeah, sure. He's he's reading our palms and he says to my friend, he goes, oh, oh, no. Hmm. And she goes, what? He goes, well, your lifeline is cut short. <laughs> That's oh, no. not good. That's a horrible thing. And yeah, I then hope he bought he, her drink. <laughs> I think we basically just said run along. But um, That's a he said to me something about... Um, you have a secret thing you're working on, right? And I said, because I was, I was writing in secret fiction. I said, yes. And he said, well, and I said, well, since you're, uh, you know, since you can read my hand, um, what does my hand tell you? And he said, well, my hand, your hand tells me that you will get what you want, but it depends on who you know. <laughs> and it was true. So That's did your true. friend have a short life? No, no. I think she's still Ooh, living. She's still working in. She's probably retired now. Um, he said it depends on who you who you know. And I had a friend at the paper who had been published many many times by Harper Collins, and she introduced me to her editor, and he published my first two books. Yeah, yeah. He was right. That's why I was asking about your friend. <laughs> I have to look up. I have to look her up and see. Uh, I'm I'm sure she's retired. She was some years older than me, but she was a television writer for the um, for the New York Daily News and then maybe for the Post. Um, but the great thing was she got me tickets to see um, Saturday Night Live. Oh, uh, fun time! Yeah, yeah. Well, the good well, old days. Back. Now we're worried about her. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go check on her for us. And we're yeah, I, I should check on her. I should check on her. I want to are you all ready to check on your dinner? Yes. yes. I'm hungry. Yes. Mm -hmm. You guys, that was great fun. It was. As usual. It was. Thank it you really for taking was. us Thank through, you. Kathy. Lisa's yeah. amazing. She was Bye. great. See Bye. you soon. Bye. Bye y'all. Good night, Sprints everybody. Tomorrow.